Mate, did we watch a thing this week? Yeah, we did. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Thanks for joining us here at We Watched a Thing. Billy, how are you, my man? I am excellent, Toph. I'm over my black lung, feeling good, feeling fresh. We're in person, so hopefully the audio should be better than last week. Very sorry about that, everybody. What do you mean? <laughs> it's almost like I forgot to turn a mic on. I know. What were you thinking? <laughs> well, clearly not much. How are you doing, though, buddy? I'm fine. Thank you. Yesterday, I had multiple teams that I follow win games of sports ball, which, like, that doesn't happen. You can't get better than that. I was beside myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really understood that saying. Is that saying that, like, you were so happy that you left your body? Like, you had an out-of-body experience and were literally beside yourself? I guess so. That's a- yeah. We should look into that. Yeah. I mean, that's not we what should, this we show is. get so. to the bottom of that. <laughs> <laughs> but what are we talking about this week? Uh, we have a request from a patron. That's right. No cinemas for us this week, my friend. We're kicking it way back old school. Back to 1970. Two? Yes. Hey. Hey, look who did their research. Nailed it. That's right. New patron to the show, Paul, wrote in requesting that we watch What's Up Doc, which he said was one of his favourite slapsticks starring Barbara Streisand from 1972. Uh, It is directed by Peter Bogdanovic and stars Barbara Streisand, Ryan O'Neill and Madeleine Kahn. It's intended to pay homage to comedy films of the 1930s, especially bringing up Baby and Bugs Bunny cartoons. So, what's up, Doc? You watched it, I'm assuming? (laughs) Sure did. I did my prep. Good on you. (laughs) Um, Let's get right into it then. I'd never even heard of this movie. Had you? No. No? No, this was news to me that it existed. Have you ever seen a Barbara Streisand film? I have now. Thank you. I mean, I'd never seen her in a movie before. I'd never seen, like, Yentl or any, like, anything. Star is Born. None of them. No. I just didn't think they were for me. And I- I didn't expect to enjoy this movie, but I was happily surprised. <laughs> Paul was onto something here. I really dug it. How did you find it? I, qu- I quite enjoyed it. The point where where I became kind of more more and more into it was when I feel like I actually got on the wavelength of the film. Of what it was trying to do, yeah. Because to begin with, I'm like, who is this person? This makes no sense. What is going on here? And then yes. it's like, okay, no, wait, if you- Pretend, like, honestly, pretend she is Bugs Bunny. Yeah. Who actually is a freaking psychopath who just messes with people. <laughs> pretend she's Bugs Bunny yeah. and that this whole thing is just a heap of fun. Yeah. That's when you're like, okay, I. It, it, so this is not on the film. This is on me for the first half hour when I was like, what, what's going on here? Yeah. I came to the film with the wrong approach. Once I was on board, I was like, okay, yeah. I'm into this. She's essentially a nut job. (laughs) She's like the Joker. She's an agent of chaos. Yeah. And honestly, that's what makes this movie so much fun. (laughs) At one point, Howard says to her, I know you don't mean any harm. And I was like, how do you know that? (laughs) This this person's done nothing but come into your life and turn stuff pear-shaped. Yeah. Where are you coming from with, I know you don't mean any harm? What does she mean then? What, <laughs> what's she doing? She's not helping you. Well, actually, it turns out she is, but he doesn't know that. No, and then he makes the giant mistake of giving her his real name. He's like, I'm not Steve. I'm Howard Bannister. What yeah. are you doing? <laughs> yeah. That is the worst thing you could do to I'll a crazy prove person. prove it. My social security <laughs> number. And here's the key to my hotel room. Oh, wait, you don't need a key. <laughs> You know who really, really took my socks off? Ryan O'Neill. He is astoundingly good in this film. Did you know he was nominated for an Oscar for it? I did not know that. Yeah. Uh, And this was only two years after he won his Oscar for Love Story. And uh, he was one of the- This is one of the funniest performances I've ever seen in a film. (laughs) I didn't know that the- um, I found out later that- that line right at the- Because I haven't seen Love Story. Right, yeah. Love means never having to say you're sorry. And he says, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Which, yeah. if I'd known that, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was just like, good point, Ryan O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> that is the dumbest thing. <laughs> well, so, mainly because you don't believe in love. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, the only thing I know Ryan O'Neill from, and it took me about 15 minutes, probably just because, I don't know- He had glasses and it wasn't set in the old timey days, was when I eventually twigged and went, oh, it's Barry Lyndon. Yeah. He, uh, Paper Moon, he's Tatum O'Neill's dad. 
And he, former boxer, he only started acting just a few years before Love Story. Yeah, right. Well, dude's got a rig. Oh, my God. <laughs> Does he have a holy inferiority complex, oh, that man? man, he is a good-looking dude. That's a good-looking rooster. <laughs> <laughs> That's what made the film work for me is is those two lead characters, really. There's so much of the other stuff that I think, realistically, you could cut out. <laughs> Even the whole confusion with all the bags and stuff, I didn't care about any of those. You know, like the old woman with the diamonds, the, the I don't know. There were the two guys who were after the top secret bag, and I don't know if one was a cop and one was a bad guy, and if so, I don't know which was one which. One was a journalist. Right. Okay. See, I didn't even pick it was that a, up. Yeah, it was a government government person. And a journalist, I think. Okay, yeah. So all of those characters couldn't really give a toss about, except for the kind of hilarity that ensued later on in the film. But I agree with you for that first half hour. It took me a while to get into it, mainly because I didn't care about that stuff. And yeah, because the film, I mean, the film really does start with something along the line. This won't be word for word for shit, but something along the lines of once upon a time there was a there plaid was an overnight bag. Overnight yeah. bag. So it seems like this is going to be really important. Yeah. And while it kind of, yeah, okay, it, you do need it to set up events, it's not remotely what the film is about. No, no, not at all. i got to say, too, let's talk about the bag itself. That's clearly a woman's bag. I mean, I wouldn't choose it for myself. Yeah. Like, it may, okay, it makes sense that Babs has it. Yep. Old lady. Sure. The old lady makes sense. It, even, even Ryan O'Neill, it makes sense because of the kind of character he is. He's kind of a bit weird and, you know. But- <laughs> What, what, what are the top secret documents doing in this bag? I mean, it's not like, in fairness to them, you would not look at that bag and go, top secret documents. That's true. That's, that's, that's true. That's, Maybe that's like quality, a- quality spycraft. Yeah, though. that's true. I know my spycraft. <laughs> <laughs> we are kind of like, I, I feel like we're burying the lead a little bit here. First time I've seen Barbara Streisand in a film. Engaging and charming as fuck. So fucking charming. I have the exact same note. In fact, my third note is, would you tap Babs? <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna walk over to Billy's microphone here. Please read out my first thing. Billy has a one-track mind and will say she was hot back then. <laughs> yeah, I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm not saying you should be ashamed. Ashamed. I'm just saying you're a pervert, and I knew you'd bring it up. But she was so charming that the the opening interaction between her and uh, Howard. Steve. <laughs> where did that even come? I was lost at that point. I was like, where did Steve come well, that's, from? It took me a while to think, like, does she actually know him? Like, is she, But I, th- I think, like you were saying before, that's just part of her fun game she's playing. You know, she's just this- She's like the original Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Just comes in out of nowhere, completely crazy, turns his life upside down, falls in love. Like, that really is how this went. But that initial interaction they had down in the- the gift shop was so much fun. They were both so effing charming. And you know, when we meet her, she's she's the person who's distracted by a pizza and walks into traffic. Like, ba- Barbara is all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I, immediately, I was like, okay, so relatable. <laughs> I like this person. <laughs> I know she keeps ordering beef sandwiches with mustard. I love beef sandwiches with mustard. Who doesn't? Other than, uh, yeah, okay, people that don't eat meat. But I think like that's a it's it's a good move by the film. We're just like we we like this person. So when she then turns this person's life upside down for no reason, yes, other than maybe she's got a crush on him because he looks like Ryan O'Neill. Yeah. Well, <laughs> at least we've already got this kind of touchstone of no, nope, she's she's one of us. So we're not just so we're not just like <laughs> who are you and what are you doing? <laughs> Babs is way better than Eunice though. I loved Eunice. Are you kidding? Like, I as I mean, I mean, as, as a, a character, character. I, I don't want to hang out with Eunice. But Eunice is great, and I, oh, I've lost the name of who played Eunice. She played Eunice so well. Yeah, look, I've seen a lot of kind of films of this ilk, this you know, this generation of comedy and stuff. And on the whole, most of them don't work for me. They they're dated, they're cheesy, they're they're just not that funny to me. This was a whole new level, I thought. I thought this was, ge- like, the entire cast was genuinely very funny, and it was really well directed. I think it was shot so much nicer than most other films of that era. Do you know the the cinematographer? No. So, Laszlo Kovacs is the cinematographer who, three years before this, had kind of turned cinematography on its head with Easy Rider. Right. 
and if you look to it's interesting if you bring him up on IMDb you get a lot of like really stock standard rom com type stuff like yeah right um things like Miss Congeniality oh shit which is kind of like this guy who in 69 just blew the cinematography world apart with all these things in this you know stoned out film that you just you couldn't do that yeah and and then his career became Miss Congeniality <laughs> yeah right because I thought this like this had a couple of really interesting shots in it, and not just that, really well directed, well framed uh, segments. I thought. And how great is it with pre CGI films? How much do you love watching stuff in the knowledge that they had to do it? When you see Babs hanging on that windowsill, and like, okay, sure, she's not on like a twentieth story windowsill, but there is a real woman hanging on a sill of some description. Yeah, yeah. with a, with a towel somehow. Staying yes. attached to her body. <laughs> Shame that. <laughs> yeah, no, that that scene to me was probably one of the funniest scenes in the film. That was almost like, you know, you can almost see where something about Mary took its inspiration from with the zipper scene where the you know, thing just keeps happening and all these people are coming into the room. It was it was very funny. That scene, yeah, I liked that scene a lot, actually. Because yeah. uh, that was probably at the point- That was where, the turning point. Where, I, yeah, I'd given myself over to the film. Yeah. By that point, it was just like, embrace the chaos. Yeah. This is fun. One one thing I like about kind of going back to the plaid cases and, and the early bits of the film, one thing I like is that the film asks you to be an active viewer. Yes. And, okay, it, sure, it doesn't matter if, like me, you didn't follow which, ca- which, which case is where at any given time. It doesn't, like, good, good for you if you do know, but it's not like it. The film doesn't hinge on you knowing that. No. But at least it does ask you to be keyed in to what's going on and actually pay attention. Yeah, more than anything, it's almost like a fun side game to be like, okay, this case is here, this case is there. It's a bit of like little, you know, sleight of hand magic where you're like trying to guess which case is where. It's really fun. <laughs> I must say, though, if you're, I, I don't know, a journalist, an undercover detective, a, ba- a crook, whatever you are, again, I have no idea what the relationship from those guys were, but you would seemingly be used to following people. Can, is there anything more cumbersome than a bag of golf clubs? Yeah, subtle much. Yeah. <laughs> like, what about just a briefcase? Yeah, mate? you're in the middle of the city. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? I know. Are there even any golf courses in the middle of the city of San Francisco? If there are, I've not played them. No, I doubt there are any. <laughs> also haven't been to San Francisco. Really? It's very hilly. <laughs> yeah, I really, I want to go. Yeah. If I'd had more time, I would have gone on my recent trip. It's not my favourite city. Ever. <laughs> Ever. But that's okay, because there, <laughs> there are a lot I, of cities. I suppose only one is. <laughs> Another thing we get out of this film, I believe, we now know where the inspiration for Tommy Wiseau's accent came from. <laughs> oh, from the uh, other guy who's going for the grant. Yeah. What is going on there? <laughs> yes. Oh, hi, Babs. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was supposed to be funny. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely- He wasn't doing a serious accent. Yeah, apparently he was taking the piss out of a critic. Right. Who had dumped on both Bogdanovich and Streisand, I think. <laughs> it's and so they decide- funny. And so they lampooned him with this ridiculous character. It's always funny when they do that. I think we've had the discussion before about Michael Crichton and the small penis defence. Yeah. yeah. Did you find the the breaking of the fourth wall weird? At what point? When did they break the fourth wall? Ryan O'Neill does it more than once. Oh, uh, yeah. No, he does. Yeah. I guess I didn't find it weird. Yeah. No, it, it seemed fine to me at the time. I I guess a lot of that comes down to the character he is, I think. He is kind of a bit- airy he's he's like absent-minded and you kind of believe he would talk to himself so it didn't bother me that he would talk to us i guess did it bother you the first time it did because i think uh i think it was before i'd kind of tweaked on to made made the switch and gone yep wait no you be the movie don't try and make the movie be you yeah um and then so when it happened again i was completely fine with it but i remember the first time it happened i was like whoa i didn't realize that that's the movie I was in, or even that I have, I don't know, do you know when did fourth wall breaking start? That would be a really interesting question. Now I want to know that. I should have looked that Me up too. before I'm, this. I mean, I'm going to see if I can, if I can Google it. 
Okay. Well, according to the article, I guess it's common in pantomime and children's theatre. So it's a very old technique. Sure, but... As far as film goes, the earliest recorded breaking of the fourth wall uh, in serious cinema was in Mary McLean's revolutionary 1918 silent film, Men Who Have Made Love to Me. Wow. Yeah. She was ahead of the the curve. Yes, she was. Uh, Charlie Chaplin also did it in The Tramp. How bad did the food in the ballroom look? (laughs) What kind of 70s monstrosity was that? (laughs) Says the person who often comes into work with apricot chicken. (laughs) (laughs) My apricot chicken is good. It's actually on our meal plan for tomorrow night. (laughs) But that weird, disgusting dish, I don't even know what it was. Some kind of gross thing. And then it it had like caviar in the shape of a treble clef on top of it. (laughs) The 70s was a horror show oh, for food. Surprised I didn't see any little pineapple on skewers or something. <laughs> no wonder everyone was so much thinner in the 70s. And no wonder the, that that ballroom just goes completely to shit because they're all just drinking and not touching the food. Exactly. Recipe for disaster. <laughs> exactly. Is is it a hotel policy that nobody lock their doors? I guess so. <laughs> because it was astounding the amount of people just going into other people's rooms. The fact that Babs could even get the name badge to go into that ballroom. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yep. <laughs> yeah, in that, that hallway with the with these apparently zero locked doors, which is a good thing because at the end of the hallway you've got the the elevator of convenience, yeah. which <laughs> which is always ready to go at any given time, despite the fact that there are 17 floors, hundreds of guests, and one elevator. And we know that no one staying in those rooms is there. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, anytime someone makes a break for it, <laughs> ding, convenience. Also, does the hotel only actually, in fact, have one floor, which is 17? I think that is correct. Why did she pick that number room? Because and it was the, it was the one room that was free. When she went there, she could see that it still had. It was the only room that wasn't taken. Yeah. And so, was her plan always just to go up and take that room? Did she was she just hoping it would be unlocked? Yeah, I still don't that know was, what her game at the start. Her was. game at the start was just getting a sandwich delivered to a room where no one would take it. Oh, so she wasn't even intending on using the room. She just wanted a free sandwich. She just wanted a sanger. That makes sense. She is the every woman. That's the one thing in the film that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one uncartoony, unzany bit. Is she just She's hungry. The <laughs> yeah. There's some. There's a couple of kind of weird edits that is good for you because it gets it down to ninety minutes. But like points in the film where it's just like stuff's happening, stuff's happening, stuff's happening. Function over. I, I was. I mean, you can imagine because I like ninety minute films. I was a hundred percent all right with the editing of the film. I don't think it ever seemed to feel like anything was cut short, but you're implying that it did? Not necessarily cut short. Just there was a couple of times where it was just like felt to me kind of that we just jumped with zero conclusion from the scene we were in. I mean, I guess I can- Like, I don't don't care. I know what you mean. Like, when when the ballroom, you know, all of a sudden the gala is over and it's just Babs and and Steve slash Howard in the room. (laughs) Yeah. And you're a bit like, well, when did the room empty? I mean, I get that, but do you want us to have a shot of everyone leaving the room? Yes, I do. Really? Yeah. I want to see them. my friend are a bad filmmaker. Handing their name badges over. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see them throwing up the awful 70s food? Absolutely, I want to see that. You want to see Joe Schmo going up to his room, taking off his clothes, having a shower, laying down on the bed. Yeah. And then you want to cut downstairs. Then I want to come back to Howard thinking about how he is legit going to betray his wife. <laughs> Which he does. Let's not- Fiance. Fiance, sorry. Yes. It's fine then. <laughs> <laughs> like Howard, as, as much as, you know, Howard is the, you know, he's, he's the straight man. Like Howard does betray his fiance. He does. He does. Is it is it implied that him and Babs actually do the deed? Do they just- ki- Not that it's any better, but obviously they make out. Yeah. I thought, because when, when old mate walked into the room that was being renovated and saw them- Yeah. The look on his face, I thought, was a they banged look. Yeah. You know that look? I, <laughs> I've given that look. I've never been on the other end of it, but I've given the look. One thing I really like about the film, which to me is another thing that sets it apart from kind of similar films of this ilk and era, is the complete lack of score. The only music in the film was when it was incidental, like during the gala dinner, during, you know, there was no. 
score at any point during the film. Yeah, which- There was a lot of silence. You'd probably expect in things like the car chase, for instance. Yeah. Where the, even if it's kind of getting towards Benny Hill sort of yeah. stuff, you w- yeah, you would expect, expect something more- to be there. And the, during the car chase, she does turn the radio on and there is some music then. But again, it's only ever incidental, which is really rare because in these slapstick things, yeah, there's often kind of zany jazz music. <laughs> But yeah, no, so I really appreciated how much silence there was. Even that that entire scene where she's hanging on the balcony, there's the fire, no music. You know, there's the sound of the TV until there's the sound of the fire. But I really appreciated that kind of silence. We spoke about, you know, obviously no CGI. They actually had to do things in this film. First American film to credit stunt people. What this was? Yep. For real? Yep. Wow. Well done, It. That's actually pretty cool because this can't have been the first american film to use stunt people clearly not that's interesting it took a british film another seven years or something wow i think it was a bond i think it was maybe moonraker how many stunt people were there in the film mate how much research do you reckon Bad research, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah did a half job <laughs> once again <laughs> at least your mic is on this time so since this was described to us as a slapstick film I was actually expecting more sla- when I hear slapstick film, I think like three stooges. Like I was expecting the entire thing to be basically nothing but stunts. I was pleasantly surprised, obviously. But the slapstick elements there are, what I really liked was that they played with them. Like of course there's people moving a pane of glass across a street. Of course there's a parade happening just around the corner. You know, like all these things, but but I like that they toyed with them a little like the pane of glass that scene just kept going and going it was like a family guy skit where it was like oh is it gonna break no it's fine and then what breaks in the end isn't even a car it's just the dude falling off the ladder i really liked that they played with those elements and there's a playful element with when they do drive into the bay yeah and their car is bobbing there apparently that was like some kind of selling point in a v-dub commercial of the time That it would float. That it would float. So in the film, (laughs) they drive it into the bay. That's pretty funny. You know, even really little details. Like one of my favourite shots is so stupid, but it's it's in that final party scene where, you know, the gangsters are there, they've got the guns, the whole thing is going into chaos. This waiter comes out the door with a glass, turns around to go back in the door, which, you know, that shot of someone walking out a door, walking in a door is pretty standard. But if he bumps the door and smashes his glasses, you know, just little details like that. I really liked that. And yet for all the for all of that stuff, I think my favourite thing about the film is actually just the back and forth dialogue between Absolutely. specifically Streisand and O'Neill. Yeah. Yeah. I I would have been happier if we just had a lot more of that and less of, you know, like I don't even, like the car chase was funny. The I really enjoyed the scene where the TV was on fire. I'd keep that. But yeah, I could have done with so much more of them just talking because- both those characters were so funny. Ryan O'Neill, when he's talking to his wife. Fiance. Fiance. <laughs> Honestly, like my first 10 minutes of note taking, I realized was just writing down lines that he said because I thought they were so funny. <laughs> when he picks up the phone, he's like, it's me, Howard Bannister, your fiance. <laughs> like as if she wouldn't know. <laughs> like, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna say hi, my name is Howard. Anyone can say that. You're right. Anyone named Howard. <laughs> It was just so funny. And yeah, the back and forth between him and Babs was so good. So here's a question for you, though. This film is now over 45 years old. If they were remaking this, I want you to throw a cast at me. Um, thank you for the prep time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought about texting you this question yesterday, and I was like, nah, let's have some fun with it. If it helps, I've done zero prep either. Emma Stone and Chris Hemsworth. I was thinking Chris Hemsworth as well. Chris Hemsworth actually has really, really good comic timing and is really super ripped and good looking. Yeah. <laughs> Emma Stone, though. That's interesting. I was thinking like an Elizabeth Olsen. Anyone from outside the MCU? <laughs> <laughs> All right, new rule. No MCU cast allowed. Is there anyone left? <laughs> <laughs> um... Okay, well, clearly not Channing Tatum because he sucks. Um, <laughs> what about The Rock? Because you know that that's what would happen if they <laughs> remade this. Movie. Oh God, it would be, it would be The Rock. That's a terrible, terrible thought. It'd be The Rock and Nev Campbell. <laughs> oh, John David Washington. Yes, I like that. He's really funny. 
Yeah, I think that's good casting. And Babs would be... Well, I can still have Emma Stone. Yeah, you can still have Emma Stone. I'm going Emma Stone because it's the easy route. (laughs) (laughs) And going from this film, you need someone who's an absolute slip of a human being who apparently thinks of nothing else but food. Yes. I guess because they're a slip of a human being (laughs) and they're hungry. (laughs) All right, so I reckon that's us done. What are you scoring this out of 10? I'm a I'm a solid solid six out of ten. Six. I enjoyed it. I, I mean, I, I know you say you enjoyed it. Six sounds so low. We've had this discussion. You're it's like above six average. Is, it's above average. It's above blah, blah. average. Yeah, I don't care. I don't care. Six is what I gave Godzilla. <laughs> right? And you were wrong to do that. <laughs> no, you gave Godzilla a seven. You gave it six thousand eight hundred out of ten thousand. Yeah. That's a seven. Oh n- well, no. Well, no. it's two hundred away from a seven and eight hundred away from a six. So which is <laughs> It's it's a six thousand eight hundred, <laughs> yeah, aka a seven. Uh, I'm giving this a solid seven. It was between. <laughs> so a- you're shocked at my score <laughs> giving it one. Above. It was between a seven and an eight, which, given our ratings, is actually the same. Probably, <laughs> it was between a seven and an eight for me. And yeah, I think if there was more of the back and forth between those two characters, it would have been higher, but I really enjoyed it. So thank you for forcing us to watch this, Paul. I never would have watched it otherwise. So yep, yep. I'm in exactly the same boat. Thanks, Paul. Really glad. So uh, I have, I got a new um, patron request just yesterday. Did you? I got a message to me personally. Yes. They wanted to cut you out of the loop. Oh, well, that's hurtful. What are, what are we watching? So our next available slot, which I think is actually not far away, is going to be Shaun of the Dead. Oh, interesting. That's cool. We also got another request just yesterday. I know that you had said that uh, we were not going to do the new Child's Play because you're a wuss. Well, news, we're watching the new Child's Play because it's been demanded. I'm not scared of it. It's just that the choice was It or Toy Story 4. I still think that what we should do is do that as a double header. I, both. I also think that. And I don't even, I think we should just flit between which film we're reviewing without even specifying the change because they're both about toys. Yeah, well, that would be hilarious if you didn't tell people beforehand. Oh, we'll cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> what are we getting to next week? Well, according to the schedule, we're getting to Men in Black. But we had a bit of a discussion the other day and you're not so keen. I am not. <laughs> I am not seeing that film. It's not happening. Does that mean we're doing Shaun of the Dead next week? We might be doing Shaun of the Dead next week. <laughs> All right. Join us next week Stay for a fun surprise. <laughs> for possibly Shaun of the Dead, possibly another movie. <laughs> in the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchthething.com or wewatchthething at gmail.com. If, like Paul, you want to demand a movie that we have to watch, or if you just want access to early episodes, bonus episodes, that kind of thing, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchthething. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at We Watch the Thing, and we'll catch you next week. Go watch a movie.